Hey everybody, welcome to the newest episode of The Bearded Gamer Show. As always, I am your host, The Bearded Gamer. I know, it's a great beard, you're jealous. Chris Arnone. All right, and I just want to do a quick shout out for all you Packers fans. Eat it! Well, then go enjoy the playoffs, but still, eat it! Anyway, all right, good news, bad news. All right, so the first piece of news for the good news, bad news today Starts off bad, but at least ends a little hopeful. Uh, that deals with the Old Republic. Now, for most of you, today is Old Republic Day. It is the day when Star Wars The Old Republic, the new huge MMO from BioWare, rolls out. And, of course, I've talked a little bit already about their early access program and how they've been rolling it out in waves, inviting people in in waves to try and keep their s servers smooth and stable. However, already we've had people complaining about two-hour queue times. And BioWare has responded to this, taking, taking this all, quote, very seriously. And they're talking about how you, you do want to have a balance. You don't want to have absolutely no queue times because then it means that your servers are too empty. And you do want to have a populated server with a lot of people to interact with. But of course, you don't want two hour queue times. Those also suck. So they're addressing it and they're working on it. But of course, today it just came out. So I'm sure they'll be adding a lot more servers very, very quickly to meet the highly anticipated demand, especially the first month, when of course the first month is free if you purchase the game. All right, some just news, not good, not bad. Uh, and this kind of goes in the rumor category. Now we've started to see some prices for PlayStation Vita game surface in the UK with a few online retailers. Uh, they've been showing, uh, and this is all in pounds, uh, $17.99 for Little Deviants or Reality Fighters, $44.99 for Uncharted Golden Abyss, so one of their big first party huge, huge titles, AAA games, and then a 30 to 40 pound price range for games like Everybody's Golf, Wipeout 2048, and Unit 13. Now, like I said, these are unconfirmed. Uh, they could just be placeholders. It's really hard to say. We're not going to see the Vita in the UK or in North America until February, but it does support what Sony already said, that they would support a pricing system with multiple price points. So big AAA titles would beat the upper tier, and you have a lot of games that would be in lower tiers. And I think that's just smart, and I'm hoping the rest of the industry catches on with what the Vita is doing with their price points for games. All right, next up is some good news. Now, some of you, especially people who are already members of Gamefly, may be familiar with their PC client. It's been in a private beta for a while. I've been a part of it. Uh, I'm a longtime Gamefly member. And it allowed you to deal with your queue using this piece of software rather than the website, which uh, I can't really say it's better. It's just a different way to do it. But it also had unlimited PC play. Uh, Gamefly acquired Direct to Drive several months back. And a lot of people were curious why. Well, this is why. They're using this direct-to-drive acquisition as part of their Gamefly client with unlimited PC play. And already, it's, it's in public beta now. That's the big deal. It's in public beta. And for people who are Gamefly members, it's unlimited play. It's just included with your membership. And they already have some great games on there, like the Assassin's Creed Director's Cut, Prince of Persia, and Saints Row 2, uh, along with quite a few other games. So that's pretty exciting news that that's coming out. It's going to be another way to access games. Uh, but it's a download. It's not a cloud gaming system. So you actually download the game, and you keep access to it so long as you're an active member. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, last piece of news is definitely a piece of good news. A little bit about Alan Wake American Nightmare. Now this is the XBLA title that was announced officially at the Spike TV VGA 2011 Awards. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there's been a lot of talk about it. Well, now we got a few more details. There's been a lot of people getting some hands-on time with it. It's going to come sometime in Q1 of 2012, so January to March. The Mid-Q1 is what they're saying, so likely February. Uh, they're also showing off what they're calling a fight till dawn mode. This is going to be like the horde mode in Gears, where it'll be a 10 minute time limit where you're fighting wave after wave of enemies waiting for the sun to come up. Now, I think this is really, really good, especially when you're talking XBLA. Sort of something with that more instant gratification does a little better as an arcade title, as a downloadable. So adding that mode in there, I think, will add a lot of value and get a lot more people on board, even people who traditionally wouldn't be an Alan Wake fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of the series. I loved, you know, it's play with light and dark and the gunplay and the storytelling and everything about it. So I'm very excited for American Nightmare. We can look for that sometime, like they said, mid-Q1 2012. So February-ish, probably. All right, guys, time for the pull list. So it's time this week again to talk about 
comic books, another nerdy thing that I just love. And as always, I will recommend go and hit your local comic book store. Industry that's really struggling. Wednesday is always new comic book day. You can head in, get to meet your local proprietor, you know, get some recommendations from him. My recommendations, go pick up some books. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. All right, first recommendation this week is The Activity Number One. And this is written by Nathan Edmondson and art by Mitch Gerrards. Now, I, I read a preview for this first issue, and it's very much like sort of Mission Impossible kind of feel to it, um, but without the crazy like disavowed stuff and with much more believable characters. As much as I like Mission Impossible, it's completely crazy over the top and, you know, Great for movies, not so good for comic books. Um, but I really enjoyed this. There were a couple pacing issues in this very first issue, but aside from that, I really enjoyed the story, the characters, fantastic dialogue. I mean, they really kept away from sort of that cheesy, over-the-top action movie-style dialogue that even comic books tend to delve into a little bit too much when they do this kind of genre work. Uh, but they did a really great job with it. Fantastic art. Really enjoyed seeing where it's going to go. I don't want to give away too much... Uh, gets in pretty deep into where the story's going to go right off the bat, and I don't want to ruin that surprise. But go pick it up. should be a great, great read. Uh, next recommendation is Fables 112. Now, I've been a big fan of Bill Willingham's Fables for a long time. For those not familiar, he takes like fairy tale stuff and well, fables from different cultures and sort of twists it around, and it's all in this sort of one oddball universe. And as you can see by the cover here, you got Santa Claus up in the corner. They're doing sort of this Christmas special one-off. It's going to be $3.99 instead of $2.99, but you're getting some extra pages in there. But it's got sort of this Christmas Carol feel, you know, Charles Dickens, uh, where they're getting into Red Rose's future and some sort of haunting look at a possible future for her. But since it's one-off, once again, great place for a new reader to jump in on just a fantastic, fantastic series. I also recommend that anyone go and pick up the trades or hardcovers of Fables going all the way back to the beginning. You will not regret it. Great, great read. All right, my next recommendation is Memorial Number 1. Uh, now, this is written by Chris Robertson with art by Rich Ellis. Now, Robertson is a New York Times bestselling author, and Ellis has been around in comics doing great art for a long time. Uh, now, this was pitched. I, I love this pitch. Uh, it's Doctor Who meets Sandman by way of Miyazaki. <laughs> now, of course, Doctor Who, very, very popular uh, time travel piece uh, of British television. Uh, Sandman, they're hearkening back to Neil Gaiman's prolific run on Sandman. And Miyazaki is the anime director who brought us the likes of uh, Spirited Away. And, and so, the, it, and it really does, I mean, that is the best way to describe it. And those are three things that I really enjoy that somehow have sort of meshed together. And it does have that sort of gaming-ish feel and, and magic and, and it's just really, really, really cool. Um, so, and they also described it as memory, magic, mythology, and mystery. And I just got such a kick out of the first issue. I'm going to be sure to keep picking this one up, and I highly recommend it for all of you as well. All right, last recommendation. Going to go a little mainstream, finally. I know, right? Three kind of indie-ish titles. And I, well, maybe not fables, but still. Uncanny X-Force 19. Now, they've just finished up this sort of dark angel saga where, you know, angel became essentially apocalypse, and now they've gone through this death and rebirth of angel. And so now it's, it's sort of the denouement and getting to the next thing. And it, there's a new creative team, Rick Remender and uh, Robbie Rodriguez are working on it now. And getting the whole team is now going to be leaving this alternate dimension that they've been in, which they sort of formed these already tight-knit relationships while they were there, but they've got to head back to the 616 universe and move on to the next thing. Uh, so it's a fantastic place to jump in. This is really one of the... Screwiest. I mean, they've always called them Uncanny X-Men, or in this case, Uncanny X-Force. Well, this is really an uncanny team. And you got Deadpool and Phantom X and Wolverine, and uh, it's just a really strange mix of people, but it really works. It's a great title, and so since they're ending one story, jumping into another one, perfect, perfect time to jump on. All right, that's about it for the pull list. Once again, go to your local comic book shop, support them, give them your money. Uh, they really need it. All right, guys, Controller Confessional. Now, I'm pretty sure I was born a Star Wars fan. I probably came out of the womb trying to figure out where my lightsaber was. Um, but, you know, today, of course, being Old Republic Day. I mean, maybe people aren't calling it Old Republic Day like we were all calling 11-11-11 Skyrim Day. But still, it's a big, big deal. There's a lot of people who pre-ordered this, a lot of people looking forward to it. 
And Star Wars has had a long and sordid history with video games. I mean, the first Star Wars came out in 77, and so virtually since there have been video games, there have been Star Wars video games. They've been around a long time. A few, some of them have been good, a whole lot of them have been pretty crappy. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to go over the most beardtastic 10 Star Wars games of all time. You ready for this? All right, number 10, Star Wars Rogue Squadron. Now, at the time, this was very much a graphical masterwork. If you had the N64 with the expansion, because the normal looked good, but you put that expansion in, it looked amazing at the time. And it was a game that really felt this, made it feel like we were in the cockpit of an X-Wing. They really got flight controls just dead on. Uh, and, you know, it still stands out as one of the best N64 games that ever came out. It was just great, great fun. Uh, number nine, Star Wars The Force Unleashed. Now, there's been all kinds of games in Star Wars. There's a lot of, you know, space flight simulators, there's been some action games, but there have been a dearth of good action games for a long time. And then came The Force Unleashed, and it was just huge. It was a ton of fun. It was, you know, it, it made people think of things like God of War and Devil May Cry and these really great action games, and it did that. Plus, it had this fantastic story. I mean, honestly, that story was better than all three of the original trilogy, or, you know, the new trilogy, episode one, two, three, combined. It was better than all those. And it was in canon. And you really got to see sort of how the rebellion started to take place. Unfortunately, its sequel, Force Unleashed 2, didn't nearly measure up. But that first one, just fantastic. Number eight, Star Wars Dark Forces. Now, this game came out when first-person shooters were really rare. I mean, everybody was raving about Doom and Wolfenstein, but there wasn't a whole lot else out there. And then comes Dark Forces. That was an FPS, and it was set in the Star Wars universe. And it really, really was huge. They created a new engine for it that worked really well, and a lot of the conventions that they created in Dark Forces are now a part of every single FPS game you're going to find. So it was just huge for its time, and still holds up pretty well today. Number seven, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. Now, this one should probably really be called Dark Forces 3 because it was the third in this line. Uh, the second Dark Forces was actually uh, Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2. And so now Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, was number three of that. But once again, it goes into this first-person shooter, continuing the same great story, um, but something they started with Dark Forces 2 and continued here. It's not just blasters and guns. It's also lightsabers and force powers and all these other things done from this first-person perspective. And... It, you know, the, the, the Xbox version caught a little flack, but the PC version still holds up. It's just a fantastic, fantastic game, and it's still considered one of the best action games ever made. All right, number six, Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. Now, Rogue Leader was a launch title for the Nintendo GameCube, and immediately out the gates, it was one of the best-selling and best-reviewed games on the GameCube. I mean, we're talking we're going way beyond that original launch, launch window, especially for third-party games. It's very high up there on third-party games because, of course, Nintendo always brings it with their first-party titles like you know Zelda and Mario. But third-party, Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader just took the cake. Fantastic space simulator. And if you had a GameCube, chances are you probably own this game. It was a shame if you didn't. One of the best titles that little machine ever had. All right, number five, Lego Star Wars. Now, I'm just going to group the whole thing together. I mean, you can get it all on pretty much one disc now anyway. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of Star Wars games that they try to be in canon, or they focus on the story, or it's got to be a good challenge. But sometimes you want to play a game that's just plain fun. And Star Wars is what started the whole Lego thing. I mean, it's branched out now into Harry Potter and Batman and Indiana Jones, and Lord knows where else it'll go. But it started with Star Wars. And it's just such a fun, all ages, everybody loved it. From the hardcore Star Wars fan to Joe Blow, who's like, well, yeah, of course I've seen Star Wars at Star Wars, but who cares? It's just that fun of a game that it locks in at the number five spot. Number four, Star Wars Republic Commando. Now, a lot of video games, a lot of anything related to Star Wars, it's all about the Jedi and the Sith. I mean, why wouldn't it be? You've got lightsabers, you've got you know, force push, you've got sort of mind tricks, lightning. Why wouldn't you? Well, because you can still tell a great story with the troops on the ground. And Republic Commando took place during the Clone Wars, where you take command of a group of clone commandos. 
And this game really sort of melded the best parts of several FPS games. It took uh, some great parts from Halo, some great parts from Rainbow Six, even Metroid Prime. It put these all together in this one great game, and then of course wrapped it in Star Wars. And you know what? That always works. It always makes people want to go and buy it. It's one of the few licenses that even in video games you go, well, it, yeah, it might be okay, but then you put it in Star Wars and it's going to be a little bit better, right? You know, so long as George Lucas himself isn't writing it, it should be fantastic. And Republic, Com Republic, Republic Commando really was a great game. FPS, wonderful, wonderful game. Uh, still holds up as one of the best FPS games that the original Xbox ever saw. All right, <clears throat> number three. X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. Now we're going to go way back, all right? This was the third of the X-Wing franchise that started, once again, way back. We're talking pre-console era at this point for these games. Uh, they were, some of these were ported over, but very poorly. But this one was just really, really well done. Uh, it was cutting edge. I mean, you had to have Windows 95 and a joystick to control this game, which at the time was like, you know, not everybody had that. It's sort of, you know, it was like the crisis of its day that not everybody had a machine that could actually run X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. Um, but it, it also introduced multiplayer into this franchise that was a big deal. And it, it already was a great fan franchise where you got to be in the cockpit and flying and, and fighting. And this, you know, did both sides of the battle. And so really, really awesome game. However, it never lived up to its own predecessor, which is our number two, TIE Fighter. Now, TIE Fighter was the very first Star Wars game where you got to play on the side of the Galactic Republic. You got to be the bad guy. You got to fly the TIE Fighter. Now, this made a bunch of advancements over the original X-Wing game. Uh, it had uh, improvements like uh, 3D HUD, uh, sub-targeting and a message log and this whole message system. And so it just added so many improvements that it completely made the original X-Wing game obsolete. It was just so, so much better and just a fantastic, fantastic uh, space simulator game. And it, it's really one of these games, you look at it and you go, <laughs> we've gotten so used to photorealistic graphics, you realize the hard work they had to put into games back at that time to make them look as good as TIE Fighter did back in its day. It's just, it's just phenomenal and it's a great, great game. Number one, what is the number one best, most beardtastic Star Wars game of all time? I'm sure some of you have probably guessed by now since I didn't already say it. Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic. Now, amazingly, we didn't get a Star Wars RPG of any kind until 2003 when Knights of the Old Republic came out. And this is, of course, Bioware, the company who has really made a name for itself with the likes of Mass Effect and Dragon Age and the company who is putting out Star Wars the Old Republic MMO. And uh, this game, it just, it did everything right. The graphics, the voice acting, the gameplay, the story. And it's the first game that really made you feel like you were in the Star Wars universe. Say what you want about George Lucas's ability to, inability, I should say, to write dialogue or introduce goofy ass characters. The fact is, he crafted this brilliant piece of fiction, this brilliant world. And to put us in it with Knights of the Old Republic, was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. So, of course, the big question is now, will Star Wars The Old Republic usurp Knights of The Old Republic? It's looking to be huge. My roommate's already been playing it quite a bit. He got into the early access, and he's just loving it, loving it, loving it. So we're really going to see how the reviews come down, how the final product looks, how BioWare and EA can keep up with the servers and doing their first MMO. Very excited to see how it all comes down. So those are my top 10 best Star Wars games of all time. What are yours? What did I miss? Was I completely wrong? Should Masters of Tarascasi been on there? <clears throat> Sorry, couldn't actually say that with a straight face. All right, guys, we'll see you next time.